the first question is actually um, uh, for you, Jean. Um, it's, it's around how you think people are feeling right now uh, at this stage of the conference, because we've been through so much. And yeah, what are your reflections? Well, I'm sure I was supposed to be inspired by these amazing stories that we've been hearing all day today of disrupting entire industries and, and saving uh, children in Africa and revolutionizing capitalism as we know it. Um, and I guess one of the things that I would just say, uh, some, I'm feeling a little bit of is like, wow, you know, now I'm gonna go back to my crummy little life and not save the world, you know? <laughs> and, 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 and what does design thinking really have to contribute to that? And, and I guess as I pulled myself back from the edge, um, <laughs> it seems to me that, that what design thinking does is it focuses, it changes our conversation. So in some ways, I think that, uh, that we go into design thinking thinking that the payoff is going to be in the answer it comes up with, in the more innovative, more creative answer. But, but I think what I've come to conclude is that in some ways the most powerful thing it does is change the conversation, right? And it, it allows us to talk to each other in new ways, and in particular to me, it brings out the possibility conversation. Right? I mean, we, uh, there's a comment that I've always liked uh, because I think it describes strategy, but it was said by Richard Buchanan, who was dean of the, uh, at the time of the design school at Carnegie Mellon. And he said, all great designs occur at the intersection of possibilities, constraints, and uncertainties. And I've always thought that that was the best description of a good business strategy that I'd ever heard. And if we look at where do we go wrong traditionally in business, I think it's that we get caught in the constraints. We start the conversation with constraints and we never really get to the possibilities. Or by the time we get to the possibilities, we're so drowning in the uncertainties and the constraints that the possibilities don't look much different than the world we live in today. But it seems to me we all have amazing individual possibilities, right? So for me, the question, and, and I worry a little bit about about disruption too, because you know disruption isn't an end, it's a means, right? I mean, we don't disrupt just for the sake of disrupting. I mean, as business people, we're kind of not big on disrupting if we don't have to, right? We disrupt because we want to create something new and exciting, and creating something new and exciting requires that we be willing to disrupt the kind of comfort of the status quo. So, so I guess where I am now is I'm asking myself, okay, given my world and the impact I can have in the world that I inhabit, what, what if anything were possible for me, right? How do I ask that possibilities question and be inspired by people who are, have tackled amazing possibilities, but but we all have important possibilities within our reach, right? And, and I think that's it. So I feel like if I can go back, if I can leave thinking about, given what I've heard and given what's inspired me, what is, what is my possibility that I see? So we're gonna so, go a little bit deeper into that and there'll be people here coming up with possibilities and also maybe some brick walls that we're gonna share a little bit later. Dave. Uh, you were doing some stuff differently, but also uh, a great mentor of mine, Noel Todd, says, Jeremy, not much changes in business. Um, you know, you've got email and stuff, but the fundamentals are the same. So through your eyes, what do you see as changing around us, and what do you see as actually not changing, and what do we need to recognise? Yeah, I mean, I think there there are a lot of new technologies that are changing the way uh, people spend time and how they communicate, right? So um, as businesses, you have to realize that uh, you know, 20 years ago, uh, you didn't have to think about having an online presence because the internet didn't exist. Now everyone's spending you know, 12 hours a day staring at a screen, and increasingly, uh, they're spending their time on mobile devices and, and on social networks. and and as a business, if you're selling th something to consumers, you 
have to be in these channels where consumers are spending their time. Um, and there's kind of an increasing level of noise in the world today, and, and um, it takes kind of a, a, a higher and higher barrier to, to be signal amongst all that noise. Uh, but I, I think fundamentally, um, I think you're right, not, not that much has changed. As a business, you have to be producing products and services that, that people want to buy. And being able to sell those products or services over the internet um, allows you to have a bigger audience. But at the end of the day, uh, people aren't going to buy your product just because you're selling them on the internet. And as Derek was saying, uh, you know, I think people are more engaged in, in how companies are, are behaving and how they're treating the environment and want to support brands and companies that are having an impact, but they're not going to they're not going to buy uh, clothing from Icebreaker. They're not going to buy glasses from Warby Parker just because uh, they're being thoughtful and uh, about sustainability. They're going to uh, buy those products because it's the best products and they want to wear them and and those products should, should have to stand on their own. And so um, I think those fundamentals around how businesses operate and in providing value for for consumers don't change. I think there are uh, just kind of different channels that uh, that companies need to be aware of that um, should be able to accelerate their growth, accelerate the spread of ideas, and, and um, create a, a bigger audience than, than was possible before. Rob, thank you. Rob, can you comment on the same question? What do you think is changing and what do you think is still fundamental? Yeah. And, 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 and what do we do about it? Yeah. Um, I also share the view that there's a lot that's really similar. You know, it's interesting at in, in New Zealand, we'd often wake up and everyone would say, oh, the market's never been so competitive. You know, we've got this happening and that happening. And my uh, deputy at in New Zealand, uh, a guy, Norm Thompson, been there for 40, I think he's come up to 45 years. He's saying, God, it used to be like that 10 years ago or when Pan Am were here. Or the Wright brothers or whatever and, <laughs> and I always used to have him on about the Wright brothers, he didn't mention the Wright brothers but um, business undoubtedly is cyclical, you know the solutions available to us uh, today are, are very different, uh, certainly what I see is that technologies allow us to amplify our voice and amplify our reach and accelerate the speed uh, of, of dynamics. And there are opportunities for us. Uh, we also see that uh, distance and communication is changing the world and allowing people uh, to be uh, much better informed. I mean, people that are living in, in poverty, for example, you know, we've talked a little about today, are far more aware of how other people in the world are living than they ever would have been uh, aware a long time ago. Uh, and again, that creates opportunities, but it also creates uh, tensions and potential for a much greater social unrest. Uh, and I think we're seeing that manifest itself in many forms around the world uh, as well. So it's kind of double-edged sword. You know, we're seeing familiar cycles come around and around, but uh, we've got new opportunities and new ways to respond to those cycles. Jane, you've been to a lot of conferences, um, and I'd like to know, thank you, Rob, um, I'd like to know what, what you learnt here, because as well as a teacher, you're a learner. Mm -hmm. um, were there any new ideas or new insights that you personally gained uh, over the last couple of days? Well, I, I mean, there were so many of them. I, 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 I don't know really where to begin. I learned a lot. I didn't know about social networking being one of the geezers. I have a lot of learning potential. I mean, I learned a lot about retail. Um, I learned, heard a lot of inspiring stories. I learned a lot about China. Um, I, I guess, uh, for me personally, one of the things that I've thought about as I've sat here over the last two days is that um, I know for me, and I imagine for most of the people in this room, um, we're fairly senior people in our careers, and we, uh, we're normally surrounded by people who look to us to have the answers. Right? And so oftentimes I come to a conference, I fly in, I give my little talk, and then I leave, right? And, and, and really, I, I act like a knower, 
right? I'm, I'm a knower. I show up and I tell people what I know. And, and I think the more senior we are and the more people look to us for answers, the more we become knowers almost, almost without thinking about it, right? And having been here for two days, kind of not flying out because part of the original, I, well, that's one of the advantages of uh, being in New Zealand. It's not like I'm gonna go do a talk anywhere else this afternoon. That's why, right? we, <laughs> that's why we put you on this panel, so you had to that's stay for could keep it two, two days. days. And yeah. being here has been so powerful for me because it's let me get in touch with being a learner again. And one of the commitments I'm leaving with is, you know, I spend my life surrounded by people who look to me as the knower. You know, I give talks, my students, you know, who if they don't act like I'm a knower, don't get a good grade. So, so and, it's, and it's very easy, I think, in that environment to stop learning, right? And, and, to, to, and it, it just happens by itself, right? I didn't want to stop learning. I, it just happens because of the way our lives progress. So one of my commitments is, you know, I, one of my favorite uh, quotes has always been uh, by one of Jack Kerouac's compatriots, a uh, poet, uh, who said, in a world of change, the learners shall inherit the earth, hmm. while the learned shall find themselves perfectly suited for a world that no longer exists. Hmm. Um, and I think that's the trouble with being learned, right? We turn around one day and, and the world we're suited for no longer exists. And so it, this has been a great opportunity for me to go back into learner mode. Um, Maybe you could put that on the wall at Garden Business School. Exactly, that's right. Uh, Dave, um, you're a great learner and a sponge. Um, what are some of the things which you've picked up uh, here? You've taught me a lot, actually. I've got some very practical ideas from you. Um, but what have you learned from others, or what are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think to just follow up on this, this last point, I, yeah, I think uh, right, that the theme of uh, the summit is disruption by design, and um, I think just recognizing that uh, you don't just kind of disrupt something once and then can, can be content and, and complacent, um, but uh, disruption is this kind of constant cycle and you, uh, to be successful and, innovate, and innovative, uh, you constantly need to disrupt your, your own business and, and everything that you're doing and it's not designing one, one chair and, and looking back and saying, wow, that's a beautiful chair. It's, um, designing that chair and then thinking about, okay, how can we design a much better chair so no one wants to sit in that one? Um, and um, yeah, I think the, the best companies that are creating kind of the most value, uh, both in, in terms of kind of what their, their business fundamentals look like, but also the most value to society are those uh, businesses that are, are constantly disrupting themselves. And, um, and um, you know, we, we met at a, a Google conference and um, and I have a, you know, a ton of respect for the leaders of Google just being really long-term thinkers, uh, building self-driving cars and hot air balloons that, um, that allow uh, people in, in rural regions to, to have internet for the first time and uh, things that have nothing to do with kind of a search engine that is their, their fundamental core business. Um, and so I think it's just uh, in, inspiring for me to you know, talk to people and. Um, a lot of people came up uh, after my talk and asked, well, um, has Luxottica tried, tried to do anything uh, to compete with you? And, um, and they certainly are aware of what we're doing. We've uh, kind of met with their CEO, but they have a massive, highly profitable business. And for them, it, it doesn't make sense to kind of disrupt everything that they have going for them to, uh, to compete with us head on. But that gives us a lot of runway um, to, uh, to grow, and, and by the time they, they do compete, hopefully it's kind of too late. Um, and so, I, you know, I think it, it's uh, whether it's a, uh, you know, a a company, a nonprofit, a government organization, always thinking about um, change and in, in future, and, and not allowing yourself to be complacent. Okay, uh, if we build on that, Rob, um, what have you learned, and is there anything that you want to put into motion? that is unexpected out of this? Starting first with the insights. Uh, well, actually, it's fascinating. You know, you, you never want to stop listening at a, uh, at a conference like this, because I actually thought that last quote of, of Gene's just before was one of the most powerful things I've heard in the last two days. That whole notion of learning versus learned 
you know, the greatest risk to the future of our, our businesses, our enterprises, our endeavours, is that we perceive ourselves as learned, you know, and I, I, it's just interesting listening to Dave and the, the description of Exotica as, as effectively a learned organisation. They've got a model that works, why change, versus someone that's coming along and, and learning to, to do it differently. Um, it's actually incredibly powerful and, and it, it doesn't matter whether you, you, you're an early stage organisation or, or an organisation with a lot of history, that risk of dropping into perceiving uh, you're in that learned position I think is, is incredibly, uh, is, a, is a real risk, a constant risk that, that you have to battle against. Uh, I guess one of the really big insights for me over the last couple of days um, I don't know if it's a New Zealand thing or whatever, but the time you spend in the audience uh, listening to people uh, speaking from the stage here, reflecting on the comments, the, the, thing, the biggest impact for me is it's a bunch of really normal people. You, you know, there's not, the, we're not engaging, we're not surrounded by people that have some mystical gift or, or some particular you know, world-class capability per se, it's actually people that are just being clever and being smart and they're searching for insights and finding them and they're succeeding not because they're clever or they've got more intellect than someone else, it's how they've applied themselves to an opportunity and a problem and it's the human characteristics of the people about risk-taking, about passion, about endeavour, uh, that's what defines the people uh, that I've found myself surrounded by the last uh, couple of days. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, we're going to open it up now. Um, so I'd love to hear from others. Uh, and, you know, you're not sharing with us, right? You're sharing with the Better by Design community, the 410 people that are split between these three rooms. So. Uh, what can you share with us around what insights you've had and what you're going to put into motion as a consequence of that? I found this incredibly insightful, this conference, and one of the things that I found most exciting is that my, my label's 10 years old this year, and it's gone through a huge amount of change in the last three years. Um, and a story that I have um, is that I, I trade ethically and have been doing for the last 10 years, but I've never told anybody about it. All my products are handmade in the north of Vietnam in Hanoi, and I use uh, traditional craftspeople to do all the beadwork and embroidery on my products. Um, and uh, it's keeping a traditional craft alive, it's keeping work in the villages, um, we pay well over the average wage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also we are uh, supporting non-urbanization. Now it's something that I've just never told my consumer. And um, I've had all these conversations over the conference, and, the, and today, this afternoon for me, has just been so insightful because it's given me the confidence now to take action and to tell that story and hopefully find some partners to come on board with me um, to make more change in the world um, and, yeah, support non-urbanisation, basically. And so thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. <clears throat> cool. Thank you. Throw your hand up and you'll get a microphone. It's a lot more fun yeah, than picking people from random. Thanks, Nigel. Uh, I'd just like to continue on a little bit more from um, the question that I asked earlier about the philosophical nature of our consumer-oriented um, thinking. and. Um, I guess from a design perspective, it's throw, it throws open the question um, to me, personally, what am I going to do um, about enabling companies to think differently about what they are actually selling? Because, um, you know, it's, it's, it seems to be a world of going and selling more stuff um, <coughs> as opposed to um, going about selling um, human things that human human beings value so um, that's I think that's a big design challenge for us and I'm not quite sure um, just sort of thinking on the fly here you know um, I like boats I like fishing um, 
So the idea of actually making a whole lot more money so I can buy a bigger boat, so I can go further out to catch bigger fish, you know, it's a really attractive thing to do, but it's going to use more gas, it's going to use more of the Earth's resources. So what, what is it about, um, uh, what, what's going to change my mind about this um, so that I um, think more from a social and environmental perspective about what I'm doing and what I actually really need um, and what, what other ways are there of um, satisfying my wants and what do I actually really want myself? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, it's cool, right? And when you look at Sam's presentation, you know, you measure sales, which is one success metric, and then you measure impact, which are the real outputs. And we saw through Sam's presentation the line of sight between the purpose of the business and the impact, as opposed to just the metrics. And the reason Google do those extraordinary things, Dave, what's their purpose? Organising the world's information. So when they come from that, there's a huge sphere of purposeful work that comes. Mel. And then you, uh, George. Um, firstly, I want to thank the three of you for speaking today, particularly to you, Dave. I think your story is extremely encouraging for everybody, so thank you for coming. Um, my question's actually to you, Jean. Over the last two days, everybody has been very excited about the concept of George and Jeff um, that we heard about yesterday. Um, I think for most people, what they really want to know is how do you get those two people in a room and get them to have a conversation? Because everybody, I'm thinking about the organisation I'm from, we all have Georges and Jeffs, but actually to get that partnership working, you've actually got to get those people together, and they've got to recognise their differences and celebrate the diversity of each other. Yeah. So how do you start that conversation? You know, well, I think in a perfect world, we'd like to believe that if you just put people in the room, they kind of join hands and sing kumbaya and good things happen. <laughs> But we all know that you put George and Jeff in the same room and good things generally don't happen, right? Um, they need structure. And I think that is the huge challenge we face. We know that diversity is fundamental to innovation, right? That, that it's our own individual mental models that keep us from seeing opportunity. And, and in order to really be creative, we want to put as diverse a team of people as possible together. And that's diversity in terms of backgrounds and skills and perspectives and all kinds of things. Yet the dilemma is all that diversity makes collaboration extremely difficult. So you can build the team, but getting the payoff of the higher order solution rather than the, than the, you know, the committee idea of, of no one ever made a statue to a committee, um, that I love, it, it's, it's hard to get to. I think you need structure and tools. And, and that's why design thinking is so useful. Many of the design thinking tools that we use are structured collaboration tools, right? So they create an environment where Jeff and George don't start the debate. And the debating is the problem. You know, in business, we're taught to debate. We're taught that I overpower you with all of my logic and my data. But the reality is, I'm just waiting till you stop talking so I can say what I want, and then you're doing the same. There's no listening going on. There's no attempt to find that, that, that assumptions where we're differing and test them with data instead of opinion. And I think that's the beauty, in some ways, of, of the design methodologies, right? They, they make us go get data. So instead of arguing over who idea, whose idea is better, we actually learn more and get some insights, we translate those into design criteria, and then we let the, ex the ideas speak for themselves to the extent they need our criteria, right? And then we actually do experimentation. And instead of debating each other, Je George's job now is to tell you what he's skeptical about so that Jeff can be part of the team that goes out and gathers data in an experiment that resolves the conflict. Because otherwise, debate just leads to paralysis. Action leads to the possibility of momentum and forward movement. So that's, that's what I think. Thank you. Uh, George, what comments did you have? Um, we're looking for insights and how that leads to uh, action. 
Well, actually, I've uh, just discovered through Jean that I've had a lost identity all my life. My name's really Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I've been having a few problems with George. But, <laughs> but never mind. But actually, no thing I'm t talking about, and I think I have probably gained a bit of confidence to go ahead with it. Um, I believe a lot of people um, in a lot of, lot of areas actually define quality by size. And I mean, that can go from a big boat, <laughs> but in my case, I'll talk about a bottle of wine. So um, a typical large bottle of reserve wine is about, can be up as high as a thousand grams. And so quite often you can get a bit more money for it and um, it'll sell about three times faster than a 500 gram bottle. Doesn't look quite as good. Um, but we're, um, we're, we've gone right down the sustainability path and we've won the Green Ribbon Award, so our mission is to be sustainable. So the debate we've got at the moment, um, there are new bottles out that are 400 grams, which are pretty small. They don't look anywhere near as attractive as a, even a 500 gram bottle or a 1,000 gram bottle, but I sort of feel that we're, you know, it's wasting resources because if you put those bottles on a boat, you ship them over the UK or Europe, you're using a lot of power, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of diesel, and um, using up a lot of environmental stuff you don't need to. And I think that applies to a lot of other things. So, um, so I think um, I'm, I'd say, pretty keen to go ahead and that. It's a big risk. Um, the um, Georges, probably in the company, will be a bit horrified um, <laughs> in sales, marketing, finance, and profitability, because we'll all probably lose a bit of business initially. So I'm a Jeff, so let's go ahead. So, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll probably, so it's actually an environmental question as well as a branding question. Thank you. And George, what you've provided here in terms of the venue is stunning. Uh, and your team have been amazing. And also, uh, last night, uh, one of your Businesses Vitals cleaned up, won winner of the year, a uh, bunch of half a dozen trophies. And George, as a treat for us, also said he'd be pulling out a few reserve wines to taste some of these award winning wines as a little um, treat uh, just to kind of share in the success that Villa are currently enjoying. So uh, after this uh, final close, uh, thanks for that, George. Looking forward to that. Um, any other questions or thoughts, insights? Brian. I had a question. I had a, um... Sorry, you must have a microphone or they can't hear you in the back. Thank you. <laughs> the, the, um, we, we have a lot of international guests here, so we're always on our best behaviour, um, <laughs> uh, particularly when it comes to our government and how we manage ourselves and so on. But the gentleman who was from a, a major government agency is something that I would um, really applaud in the sense that I've just spent um, nearly six weeks in Scandinavia and observing the way they have good government and smart government in all sorts of different ways and think that the Better by Design movement has made an impact in certain sectors, but it certainly hasn't made a movement in creating what I call good government. We have a lot of politicians that want to downsize government, but not necessarily for the better in my view. So I, I, I argue the case for smarter government and I argue the case for the fact that we're great at consultation in New Zealand, hell of a good at it. We spend a lot of time talking with each other, but we don't often inject great ideas. This movement has that potential. I just wanted to leave that talk with you. I, I really applaud the different uh, government leaders that are in the three rooms today. I think the uh, attendance here has been the beginning of something great and I, I'm totally with you. Um, I believe that in a country like New Zealand, you can have impact in a short space of time, because one thing that we do do very well is act quickly uh, when we've got clarity around what that future space can look like. Any other thoughts or comments? This is actually a fitness test. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Murray Higgs, I, I don't have a question. I don't have a comment, although I've found the conference stimulating and inspiring, as, as usual. Thank you. But I have a question for Rob, if I may, because 
I think uh, we all value Air New Zealand. I mean, that's a really important asset. And I think we all experienced your um, input, contribution, change, and now you've left it. And I'd just be interested, I think that'll be very disruptive, but I was interested in whether that disruption was going to um, produce a, a much stronger airline. Um, it's, it, it's an interesting process you go through uh, when, again, probably referencing back to Jim's last comment, you figure out at the point that you risk becoming a bit uh, too learned uh, in your own organisation. Um, and, you know, I felt at, at Air New Zealand uh, we, we had achieved a lot, but as a CEO or as a leader, one of the biggest challenges is to figure out how to use your time, and how you use your time, you make a whole range of choices, and there's things you don't do, and there's things you choose to do, uh, particularly in a large organisation. Uh, I think it is valuable to disrupt that regularly so that you get someone that can come in that will reallocate time in different ways and emphasise things that have been my blind spots in my tenure um, and hopefully have the insight to be able to retain the value and the assets that I've created during my tenure and not allow those to atrophy as attention uh, shifts and gets uh, reprioritised. I do have a strong belief that in an organise, a large organisation in particular, when you leave as a CEO, um, you want to make sure that there's a good couple of years worth of value loaded up in the pipeline so that you minimise the, the risk of financial disruption while your successor is finding their feet and establishing their presence um, and their uh, I guess their goal set and their strategy for the organisation. So, so timing is everything, and you know, time will tell whether I chose uh, the right timing in terms of minimising the risk to the organisation whilst creating the benefit they could gain uh, from the disruption to a to an, a new leader. I, I'm, I think the the last nine to ten months have, have suggested that the timing probably was right. And. Because we're uh, pressured on uh, time, well, we're going to have to leave it there for now. But I think if we pick up on Rob's uh, comments and also our experience of, for example, Air New Zealand, uh, you can see what a profound impact a business has on people when it's done really well. If you think about your experience with Air New Zealand eight years ago, um, you know, I've been travelling three months, four months a year for 18 years and uh, it had a massive impact on my quality of life, as an example. So the purpose of business really is to have an impact on other people's lives. And when we do it well, uh, the payback that we get is kind of measured in sales in the short term, but the most important number I've seen uh, was from you, Dave, which are the two numbers, the net promoter score and the percentage of people from word of mouth. And social media uh, is what we all probably built our businesses on, apart from the medium was person-to-person -person communication. So social media only enables, a media only enables natural human tendencies for people to want to communicate and share. Uh, one of the great insights for me was that it's um, now transparent when, com when you're doing a great job and transparent when we're not doing a great job. So we used to measure ourselves only against the sales line, which was uh, all care and, and no responsibility. You know, I kind of hope it works. Um, but now we get that feedback loop. Uh, a lot of us feel anxious about that either because we don't want that feedback loop or we don't know how to build it. And the other thing that we found out is that that's okay because 90% of us in the room are still learning about that. But Trey's point is absolutely right. You know, let's not just pretend these trends, these powerful trends, 
which are deeply embedded in humanity and the human spirit are going to go away because they're not. All the technologies are just enabling and amplifying very natural human tendencies. So the focus of the purpose of what a business is and what it is delivering from a human point of view and where do human beings live? On Earth. So we can't then decouple ourselves from the context of where we create or where we use our products. And I think that's the bigger conversation here. How do we take a more holistic view? How do we create active feedback loops to tap us into humanity? And how do we build a consciousness around what we're doing to make us get better in a more conscious way? So I just want to thank uh, everyone in the room for being here. Uh, I want you to tell your friends about it. Next year our goal is to sell out five months rather than three months before. Um, and Better by Design is all about the people in the room and the impact that we have. So I say the and because it's the extent to which we share our learnings and share our case studies and our stories that this movement spreads, and it's only through its spreading do we actually have an impact on New Zealand. We live in such a special country, and we have such a unique position, because our country is small enough that we all can take responsibility for help governing it. So thank you. My final session is from uh, David Downs from NZTE. Just before we do that, I just want to say something about NZTE. At Better by Design, we used to fight NZTE because they were bureaucratic and they were a government agency. And I'm guilty of that. And people in NZTE didn't like me very much. And then uh, Peter came in uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, he took the job for the right reasons, moved back from Australia because he wanted to make a contribution uh, back to New Zealand. And for me, it is so inspiring seeing what was a very traditional government agency do a teardown, embrace design thinking, and not always get it right, but learn quickly and get on the court and realize why they're in business. Through that redefine and that repurposing, they're now attracting world-class talent. For example, David, who's going to speak, who's formerly from Microsoft, and Melissa, who we brought over from the UK, to take this job, um, Kiwi that came home for the right reason. So uh, I just want us to all kind of acknowledge that and be supportive partners of NZTE as they go forward on the next evolution, because it's awesome. So thanks very much, guys. Your contribution has been amazing. We'll get off the stage. <laughs>